don't like I don't mind drinking blood if it's chill. Yeah, the warm the warm really gets to you, doesn't it? It's like it coagulates and yeah. Have you ever had that experience? Um So today we are going to visit artist and tour Noah Becker and ask him a few fun questions. He is an artist, White Hot Magazine publisher and founder, sax player, and film producer of a film titled New York Is Now. So what projects are you currently working on? You know. um, well, I have a lot of people working on things that I'm doing like we're writing articles for me and um, also do it writing some articles um, and I'm working on a series of paintings one that you can see behind me uh, new series of paintings um, I haven't done filmmaking for about seven years and uh, I'm a little bit um, I think um, just defining somebody as a filmmaker, or defining somebody as a painter, or defining somebody as a writer. I think, I think people get really hung up on, on that kind of thing. I mean, nowadays it's like, for example, um, every week, I'm sure people are writing thousands of words on social media, arguing back and forth in Facebook chats or conversations. They're probably writing more than I'm writing, yet they're not called writers, they're called social media participants or whatever it is. So Absolutely. I think there's a lot of hidden <laughs> definitions. Um, I publish maybe 10,000 words a week, but I don't, I don't, I, I'm like making a lot of paintings or um, I also play the saxophone. I mean, on a very basic level, I started playing the saxophone when I was um, 11 years old in, and living in Las Vegas. And I've always played the saxophone, and then when I was 15, I started, I went to art school. But I was still playing the saxophone. And so I'm more or less um, someone who paints and plays the saxophone. Um, was that sort of what the question was kind of? Oh, the question asking? was what oh, project? Oh, what project, <laughs> yeah. We kind of got off track, but That's okay. you, you see what I'm talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, like, because your introduction was like, yeah. No, it does a thousand things, but actually, I'm an artist. Who it really is saxophone. one thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I run an art magazine, and that was kind of a surprise that it caught on and became such a big project. And that began in two thousand five. Two thousand five. Yeah. yeah, it was kind of a surprise. It was sort of like we're having a baby, and we better take care of it, sort of moment. So I had to have a lot of people come in and help me. So I've had like you know three hundred people. 300 people write articles, it's and it's been an international yeah. thing, but it's like, um, I don't really see the negative in having more contacts and, and more, uh, and um, uh, producing a lot of information, especially nowadays with the web. Um, I think I think people have to have a, a, a way, I think if you're going to be a part of this time, and I know it sounds kind of outdated, I think. I mean, I think navigating, having a, a way of navigating the web with your art is um, important. Even though the web has been around for a long time, it's like... You know, Not really, though. In the well, I come from a generation <laughs> before the internet. Yeah. Whereas there's a generation of people who never knew life without smartphones and without the internet and all that kind of stuff. Um, just kind of an offshoot question is that I'm looking at the paintings behind you with the emblems. Um, is that part of the conversation you're having with the audience right now, with these, the Google and the Apple and the Twitter? Oh, that, yeah, I mean, I think that's a little that? bit about the duality of all people. All, you go out in New York and everybody around you is looking at their phone. I think it's a bit about the sort of like the double-sided mirror, like life in the mirror and life outside of the mirror is getting blurred. So. And I think people are starting to see things in that. I think people are starting to see painting in that way, I think. But eventually people will have, like, 
some kind of contact lenses. Yeah, they put in, I, think I mean they had the Google Glass. I had some people from Google visit my studio while they were developing the Google Glasses, and now like in Seattle they have signs in certain places that say ban the cyborgs. Or if you go to a strip club, which I never do, but if you go to a strip <laughs> club and um, never, I don't even know what they do in those places, but um, apparently. It, you know, people going in there with Google Glass, it's like they can just start recording what's going on around them, you know, or invading privacy. The guy was walking around my studio and re recording and photographing all of my work without it, and I, didn't, I had no idea. That's wild. Did he have it like was, a little clip on on the side? No, or was he it just like, he had the full glasses. It was with only the when I, things, yeah, yeah, it was only when I took them off him and stamped up and you know like crushed them under my shoe that. <laughs> It's only when I crushed it well, you're in hard, shoe man. that I was like, no. right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to question number two. Talk to me in face to face, dude. Very successful. Um, do you have a certain turning point that you have in your career? And what up, do you think you did to kind of get when there? When I woke you know? up, I knew I was successful when I woke up and I was like Scrooge McDuck. I was in like a huge room full of gold coins and I, I was like diving off a diving board and then swimming through the gold and put, and then like doing like the breaststroke through gold coins. And then you know you've made it. I was like, this is a sign. <laughs> Alright, um, number three. Do you make a full-time living off your work? I make a full-time living off of the collective energy of everything that I'm doing. So you feel I like various streams of income yeah, are extremely like, important. You know, like you sell a bunch of paintings and that lasts you for a certain amount of time. And then some things happen in the magazine publishing world that you make money off of. And then, you know, um, when I started bringing people together and having them do like seances around a pentagram, I know that sounds funny. But I started charging for those sessions. It was like a thousand dollars for each candle, so each point ended up being about like five thousand dollars. But I got really uncomfortable with sacrificing live chickens because I'm, I'm really like a firm believer in like I'm not I'm not for killing living things, so I had to kind of stop that. And I learn new things every day. I don't man. like I don't mind drinking blood if it's chill. Yeah, the warm, uh, yeah. the warm really gets to you, doesn't it? It's like it coagulates and yeah. Have you ever had that experience? Um, I can't drink warm blood. <laughs> it's just too fresh. There's something too fresh about it. I like it maybe with like with some matcha. Yeah, a little bit of the green matcha. Yeah, yeah. organic, hands organic down. green yeah. matcha. It gives it a little like earthiness to maybe the. Maybe if it was like yeah, slightly funny. What one piece of advice would you give to a young artist out there that is truly serious about being an artist and pursuing this life? Well, I think there's a lot of old artists who could use some advice too, not just young artists. Sure, I sure. think there's a lot of like struggling artists of all walks of life. I've met a lot of senior artists, I've met a lot of young artists, you know. I mean, if you're, I mean, for, for me it was like, I was, you know, living in Canada, and I was feeling very isolated, and I made a film about the isolation I was feeling. I think, um, I think turning your, I think turning your problems into art can be like art therapy, and that's not exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actually like, um, I mean, I think it's what I learned from very. I've, I've hung out with a lot of people who are really like legendary, famous people, and I've learned a lot from those people. But sometimes they don't really have anything you can learn from them. Sometimes they're just people who were in the right place at the right time and happened to, you know. I mean, the reason I say I'm talking about fame is because I, you know, like if somebody's a famous actor and they paint, those paintings are more interesting. To certain members of the public, like if Anthony Quinn makes a painting, it's more interesting than some old guy who played Zorba the Greek off Broadway making yeah. paintings. Yeah, I think I think it's in large part due to the context, you know, of their life and the accomplishments yeah. that they already kind of have. Yeah, and I, okay, so um, the public has this set um, series of stereotypes. 
like for for example, the worst kind of thing is like, oh, you're an artist, are you going to cut your ear off? You're Van Gogh now suddenly because you're an artist, or you're Jackson Pollock, you're going to go piss in the fireplace. That's you know, you have like you're going to go piss in Peggy Guggenheim's fireplace. You know, so these stereotypes, it's like. You, you're operating and living your life the way you're living your life, and then suddenly all of these, like, imaginary walls, you know. So you have to kind of, like, um, you have to be aware of the, the way people think of artists, I think. And there's a large number of people in the public who the only artist they know is Banksy or something like that. Sure. And I liked a few of Banksy's things. I didn't really, I didn't agree with certain aspects of, of his political outlook um, and I liked some of his earlier work but it's like he's not the lead singer of Massive Attack. Well I so when I, oh I yeah I heard somebody, that. I know somebody who knows him and he's not, that's not. Oh thank you for not, sharing that. Like, that's, yeah, FYI that whole thing Banksy is like, people. <laughs> you know it's Banksy and then and then Shepard Fairey and these kind of guys like the street art movement all that kind of stuff is very pop art, more pop art than like Lucian Freud and Francis Bacon and Roy Lichtenstein and you know those are more those kind of then it's like all these pop artists, street artists and mainstream artists or that guy JR who does giant pay stops on the walls <coughs> all over the world or whatever it is you know. Um, what I'm, I'm gathering going is totally off topic. Well I'm kind of thinking of how you said you made a film about your isolation and so... No, I didn't make a film about my isolation. Well, kind of, but I made it... I thought, okay, this is the situation I'm dealing with in life. And this is, and this is kind of my anxiety about what I want to what I want to do in life. So why don't I make a film about my career anxiety, but not... but in a way where I'm like, it's like, okay, so I want to be a famous artist, so I'll meet with 38 famous artists who I perceive are doing what I want to do and say, what do you think about this kind of a life or living in New York or being, you know, a superstar? Is that like something that you can like pursue and how does that relate to to the online world and the situation in the world? And just kind of like ruminating and uh, I don't know if cerebralizing is the right word, but you're just kind of, I thought like, why don't I take my daydreams and my anxieties and turn them into film? Alright, so, um, five. What is the first thing you do in the morning, or do you have a morning routine? Well, I don't jog. I used to swim laps every day. Um, sometimes I stay up late, so I'm not actually up in the morning. If I'm going to bed at five o'clock in the morning, then it's the other nine to five, nine, eight, nine p.m. to five a.m. I'm trying to keep my schedule reasonable and, and do something more like in the morning, but I'm not often. I'm I'm often up after after the morning. I guess perhaps your morning then. Okay. Or, well, you know. when I wake up, and lately, not for my whole life, but late. I love the morning. I love getting up at eight a.m. or whatever it is, and you know. Yeah, me too. It's it's great, but I can't. I don't do that every single day. Um, my morning, meaning when I wake up, um, I usually just you know just do normal stuff like go out go out for a coffee, um, you know, steal people's house pets, <laughs> just right. stupid regular stuff. All right, now this is kind of an offshoot question, but uh, or an interesting question. Number six, it is said on your Wikipedia that you have coined the term zombie formalism. Is this accurate, and when and where did you first talk about this? It says that? Mm hmm Really? Yeah. I, oh, weird. Well, it says, it does have that little citation needed, and when oh. I did it like a little further dig, you had actually written in an article that Walter Robinson coined it. I had, so I don't think you have ever even taken credit for it, and I'm wondering if someone oh. went into... Well, Walter Robinson did a lot with uh, the zombie formalism thing. I didn't really do yeah. much with that. Yeah. Um, I, um, I have been working with um, there's an artist, Lucian Smith, 
Do you know who that is? Um, yeah, I actually researched him when I was reading about it. Right. I didn't really know a lot about he him. He was somebody that I was sort of one degree of separation from for like the last decade because I'd worked with his father, Terrence Sanders. I'd written articles for Art Voices magazine. So I had kind of known about that whole thing for quite a while. Um, and um, I think Walter kind of ran with that and did a lot of like panel talks and different like journalistic I mean the, the basic way of getting myself in all kinds of trouble is just say yes I came up with that and somebody else stole it and used it but it's like I never really wanted to have that much of an association with zombie formalism but it was something that I talked about early on but I didn't really want like I don't really like I don't want to have like a whole art artistic movement attached I don't want to I, did, I kind of started that idea, and then I was like, wait a minute, I don't really want to, I don't, you know, so I'm not really associated to it, but it's been, it starts to pop up in things like Wikipedia and different things, but I don't, like, That's so interesting. it's, like, it has way more association to a lot of other people who really, like, sold a lot of that kind of work, the artists themselves, and also a lot of the, the value of that work has like dropped down to like 50% of its Very like true. high auction. Very true. So yeah. that's also like I kind of knew that was coming as well. I'm not saying I'm Nostradamus, but but yeah, that was something that <laughs> well, I had brought up. Well, you've run around long enough to read the That was something that I had brought up. I'm very much in admiration of those people who came before me and there's other people who are now coming along and looking at me like I'm like part of the establishment. So it's just... It keeps kind of. It's interesting. It keeps isn't kind it? of going. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not really. It's not really something. I. Uh, I've never had an adversarial perspective on, on, uh, on those kind of people. I actually went to Walt. I did. I published an article about Walter Robinson's show. Two articles actually. One written by Phoebe Hoban, who's an excellent journalist who wrote the book on Lucian, Lucian Freud and Alice Neal, and. Um, nice. And also we did a photo essay with photos by Michael Anderson of. Walter Robinson's opening. Was it at Deitch? At Deitch. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. It was really good. So we were, you know, we were very supportive of of that. Like, I, didn't, I never really had an adversarial uh, position on any of that. How do you feel right now at the point you're in in your career, whatever that means to you. Are you feeling really satisfied? Are you dissatisfied? Well, I defy anyone to open up a gallery, put paintings on the wall, or be an artist and have paintings around you, or play the saxophone, or do something that's like creatively based and really expect to take life head on with that as your thing. I think it's I think it's challenging for anyone. I think if um, if people if more people took that kind of thing seriously, instead of just assuming when they get into it that they're going to have to do something else to make it their livelihood, that that maybe some, uh, that I think the additional intensity and the additional focus can really pay off, even in an art world that is maybe like money centric or seems like. possible to participate in. Yeah.